are you? Good morning, everyone. It is 9.02, and I'm calling to order the February 13th meeting of the Workforce Education and Equity Committee. So thank you all for being here. We have two online, two in person, three in person, so that's great. Um, so the, our first, our first uh, act is to approve the January 9th minutes. Do I have a motion to do so? So moved. Okay. Moved and seconded. Are there any corrections? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Thank you very much. All right. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to, we have two presentations and then several memoranda. And before we get into the presentation, I just want to share a couple of my thoughts about this. I asked for this briefing today because we so often hear about the hiring challenges throughout the city. And so the purpose of this presentation is to help us understand the big picture of talent recruitment for the city. It's our job, colleagues, through the Workforce Committee to help shape policy that will enable Dallas to become the best city in the state of Texas to work. After this presentation and any follow-up, then we will examine retention. That will be at a different presentation. There have been questions about potential duplic duplication with GPFM committee, and we'll work together in understanding the entire progression of work. Our role, our role we, the WE committee in recruitment with GPFM's role in performance, and then ours again with how we retain the excellent employees we have and want to hire. 
Chair Willis, who's not on this committee, but serves on the GPFM committee, has been working diligently with our auditors to complete a study of civil service and human resources, and we hope to work with them later this spring, perhaps in a joint meeting, uh, for their findings presentation. I hope that everyone was able to study the presentation since we're not going slide by slide, and rather we're gonna be highlighting essential points for discussion. The entire presentation, however, is available to the public, and I'm happy to share any public questions that you send with staff. So what we wanna make sure is what we're looking for is what are our short-term and long-term strategies to address the city of Dallas's talent sourcing needs and what are the short-term and long-term strategies to establish a sustainable talent and recruitment service delivery model? Those are the main things that we're emphasizing today. So with that context, please, I wanna turn it over to our extremely able team. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so very much, Chair Schultz, and to the members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Kimberly Beiser Tolbert, and I serve as one of our deputy city managers. Thank you for the opportunity to present our talent acquisition update to the committee. Uh, we know that talent acquisition is critical, and it is a very important component when we look at our ability to provide city services. As we came out of the pandemic, of course, we learned a lot. We're going to continue as we go through not only this presentation, but as we look forward to the retention presentation that we're gonna bring back, we're gonna to continue to find ways to tighten our belt because we know that the market changes consistently and that then impacts our ability to acquire and retain top talent. I wanna thank the city council that throughout these last few years, we've had an opportunity to talk with you about many of our strategies and that support that you've provided to that process has been effective. At the chair's request, we're definitely not going to go through every slide, but we're going to focus um, on highlighting some of the key pieces that we really do believe uh, will allow for us to think about how do we make uh, sustainable changes and be able to set us up for discussions even through this upcoming budget process. Nina and Jared are both here with me this morning, and I want to thank both of them for the work and the efforts that they continue to put into this process. Um, we um, have looked at a lot of our low-hanging fruit. Many of the things that you're going to hear from both Nina and Jared today are things that we began to look at on how do we improve our processes and continue to um, um, make our collaboration between the two departments, human resources and civil service more effective. Um, as the chair's requested, we're gonna jump right into it and so I'm gonna take us to slide number four. Um, we will plan, Chair, to come back in April to give you the update on the various retention strategies. So if we could go right to slide four. Good morning, I'm Nina Arias, Director of Human Resources for the city. And uh, I'll start by speaking about the full cycle recruitment process, uh, which starts with the job description and ends with onboarding. So as the first step, the hiring manager revises or develops a job description and opens a requisition for posting the job. After that, an HR or civil service recruiter, depending if the job is civil service or non-civil service, will post the job, collect applications, and perform any testing that is appropriate for the position. HR or civil service staff then, they perform a first scan of the applicant pool to identify if the applicants meet minimum qualifications. At the city, some hiring managers uh, ask to see all that qualify, while others lean on recruiters to identify the top rated. So that flexibility ex exists within the system. Then the hiring manager selects the top three to five applicants and schedules interviews. After the interviews, the hiring manager may, will, will make a bearable offer and that happens if pay is under the budgeted midpoint. Once the applicant accepts the offer, the onboarding team issues a formal offer. The final offer initiates the background check and drug screen, completing the pre-employment process. Next slide, please. In this slide, you will see the recruitment process at a glance with the main steps on the left column and the responsible party for each step in the subsequent columns. It shows three distinct recruitment processes for civil service, non-civil service, and uniform positions. For civil service and uniform positions, civil service staff does the posting, the first screen, and the testing. From that point on, the hiring manager does the interview and HR completes the onboarding. 
For positions that are non-civil service, the hiring manager and HR staff are responsible for all the steps. Next slide, please. As you were able to see in the deck, our look back uh, to 2022 uh, shows that we continue to operate with two systems to complete the hiring process. NeoGov, which is a system that was implemented over 10 years ago, which has significant data reporting and role configuration limitations. And Workday, which is our system of record and the system where the hiring process is completed. We are moving the entire process to work day in 2023, which will allow a simpler, more expedient process, including self-service for candidates and hiring managers, interactive communication and follow-up, and funnel reporting and analytics. In addition, we provided an overview of the positions that were filled in 2022. Those are external hires. We provided an overview of the current market data and highlighted programs and activities implemented to support recruitment and retention at the city. I'm going to go past to slides 12 and 13 to take a few minutes to highlight a few key accomplishments. Slide 12, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so on slide 12, among the body of work and successes for 2022, I would like to highlight the gender transitioning information toolkit. Uh, that This toolkit assists gender diverse employees understand and use the resources available to them at the city and in the community. Also, the hiring manager toolkit, which was a collaborative effort and is explained in more detail later in the presentation. Next slide, please. From slide 13, I'd like to highlight the move to a weekly employee orientation to speed up the onboarding of new hires and the city diversity dashboard, which was done in partnership with the Office of Data Analytics and Business Intelligence. Next, I would like to move to slide 17. From this point on, um, or in the next slides, uh, we have information about the SHARE Human Resources and Civil Service Initiatives of 2022. It provides details on those initiatives which were designed to improve the City of Dallas talent acquisition process. This work resulted in a manager toolkit that contained all the information needed for hiring managers to complete an expedient recruitment process and information about a recruitment manager dashboard that provides directors with current data reflecting the hiring process and hiring data by department. If we could please go forward to slide 20. This slide shows the dashboard for department leadership. I would like to note that they um, make a few notes and disclaimers regarding the data in the system. The average days between requisition approval and candidate list creation does not differentiate between first candidate list or continuous posting. Also, the average days between the candidate list creation and the offered data position that are left open for continuous posting uh, are, is not reflected, and it reflects manual data entry for offered date. Uh, all those are factors of the limitations that we have in the NeoGov system, which will not be um, a si the same situation going forward with Workday. Also, the average days between offer and start may include instances where candidates decline the offer and does not differentiate internal delays or candidate delays. If we could go to slide 21, please. This section uh, shows the positions that are currently posted by type of positions. These are open requisitions in NeoGov. Also, current data showing the average time between the time the requisition is created and the start date, and the average time to hire by department. Um, in addition, this section, the current state session, provides information on benchmark and other data points that we use or will be using in the future 
um, including turnover data and surveys. If we could move to slide 27, please. Slide 27 uh, provides an overview of what are the high-level candidate priorities that help us determine the best way to address expectations of candidates. Um, as, as shown through ADEDEC, the conditions of the market have changed substantially over the last two years and since the pandemic. So in the following slides, the slides of third, you know, from 27, I believe, through 20 uh, through 30, um, shows a SWOT. We conducted a SWOT analysis to identify what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for each of these four candidate priorities. Um, and the SWOT provides us with a roadmap to further develop our talent strategy. I would like to jump to slide 30, which provides details and opportunities from the perspective of the four candidate priorities listed in this slide. So going to slide 30. So here are opportunities in regards to compensation, balance, flexibility, and upskilling. The opportunities related to compensation include implementing a pay for performance program for executives. Uh, that work is underway and is scheduled to be implemented in 2023. Also using whole market comparable data for competitive and hard to fill positions and functions instead of comparing just to government organizations. Also, opportunities to improve organizational support for a balanced work-life approach include increasing vacation allowance for professional staff to match the market. Currently, we offer the same amount of vacation to em all employees regardless of level, uh, which is definitely not comparable to market, and investing in change management and programs to help managers move to a culture that values work-life balance, because ultimately, the employee experience happens at the manager level. Um, regarding flexible work arrangements, we could provide, uh, actually we, are, we, we identify that an opportunity is to provide a city of Dallas uh, managers training and resources to help move the, to operation models that take into consideration the need of employees which is an employee center operation model. In other words, we can do the work while taking into consideration the needs of individual employees at the same time. And our opportunities for upskilling include implementing workday learning module, which was approved for 2023, and expanding the current educational partnerships, which is underway as well. We have, if we could please move to slide 32. Slide 20, 32 uh, show our 2023 goals and the talent acquisition strategies uh, that our staff are going to be working on, which center around five pillars. The first one is to strengthen the city's employee brand which includes engaging professional resources to develop a cohesive talent acquisition brand to attract candidates to the city of Dallas, highlighting the meaningful work we do and the many career opportunities the city provides. Also observing and actively managing online reviews and so our social media presence. And working with hiring managers to invest in candidate relationship management to create a pipeline of candidates for current and future job opportunities. The second pillar is to further simplify and decentralize the hiring process. This includes empowering hiring managers to own and manage the end-to-end -end process of acquiring talent for their teams and as a, as a means for creating best strength for succession planning. The third pillar is to update our sourcing strategy, making extensive use of social media as well as employee, professional, and diversity networks and utilizing third parties to supplement staff. The fourth pillar is to improve the candidate experience, continuing to update and updating and refining our processes and practices based on the feedback from hiring managers and through candidate surveys. And the fifth 
uh, pillar is to leverage data and technology. Include, uh, includes the implementation of work day recruitment module and completing the 2023 external recruitment dashboard in collaboration with the Office of Data Analytics and Business Intelligence. If you could please move to the next slide. In addition, we're currently working on a process improvement focusing on onboarding, which is, is, is meant to streamline and document the process in preparation for the work implementation. As part of the project, we have identified several pain points which we are in the process of addressing, including the need for different approach to our background checks and drug test contracts, the requirements in job descriptions, and simplifying workloads. The next slide, please. Workday recruitment implementation is scheduled for completion in 2023. The detailed um, process is listed in this slide, which starts with city council approval and ends with production in November, deployment in October and full production in November. This work will include input, or the, 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 the project, the implementation project will include input from all hiring departments and will be done in collaboration with Jared and the civil service department team. Next, Jared will share with you about the work of the civil service staff. Next slide, please. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, Madam Chair, and uh, to the Workforce Education and Equity Committee. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Jared Davis, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Civil Service Board Secretary and Department Director. Um, if I could really start our conversation this morning um, on slide 39. Upon joining uh, the city in this capacity and, and, and attempting to give leadership to the Civil Service Department, we went out on an on a exercise at the very beginning of conducting a SWOT analysis and really listening to our stakeholders and everyone in the organization to understand what are our opportunities, what are we good at, what are we not good at. And an outcome of that, and really why I want to start the conversation today on slide 39 is out of that, we really came up with three funnels of work, if you will around talent attraction in civil service, around talent assessment, and around operational excellence. And, and, and the talent attraction piece is how do we evolve our practices and position the city of Dallas to, uh, to attract talent um, to, to, within, to the city in our, in our open opportunities. Secondly, how do we assess that talent once, once we know that there's an interest or someone's attracted to work for the city of Dallas, and then internally, how do we continue to get better in terms of op operational excellence? And so you will see all of our work and strategies and outcomes really tied back to those three strategic focus areas, because that's really what we believe it's gonna take in order to position the city of Dallas as a premier public service employer and be able to recruit talent into the organization in a timely and efficient manner. Which brings me to slide 41, which we've really developed are, are the civil service talent imperatives. These are the things that we feel that we must do to position as, as civil service has 83% of the city of Dallas's workforce in terms of its positions that are considered civil service positions and for which the department is expected to provide sourcing and screening support. Um, here, are our, here are our imperatives. Number one is we have to expand our candidate reach. You saw in the deck that the applicant pool is drying. I think we know both within our own walks of life and, and, and as hiring managers or even in your personal lives, recruiting talent is harder. Um, and so we have to expand our reach and really, really rethink how, how we do that. And the only way we can reach candidates in, in this century is through our strategic marketing, branding, and social media efforts because that's where the candidates are. We need to intentionally continue to gather and utilize market, career, and position data to develop and refine talent sourcing strategies. By that I mean that, the, that we have different data points as we interact with different jobs and positions and career series across the city that we should be using that market data to, to give us feedback on how to get better at that. By way of an example, within the Civil Service Department, we have begun to um, identify what we call 15 to 20 critical and hard to fill positions. Some of those are tra um, trades, some of those are um, uh, professional, in terms of mid-professional careers, but we've identified those in trying to understand, A, what are the skills that those in incumbents are performing, so as we go to the market, we have a better idea of what we recruit, and so that's what I mean by utilizing market um, data to develop and refine our, 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 our sourcing strategies. Um, 
create career interests and establish talent pipelines into critical civil service and public sector careers. I think that we're doing this a lot independently, but bringing that into a, a, to a strategy and a clear line of sight of working across our partners of Dallas College, Dallas ISD, and others to bring that into a singular focus on how do we develop those pipelines, be it at the CTE um, level or at the, P, at the PTEC level within our ISDs. I know that um, we recently had some briefing about those educational partnerships and another committee, but I think we're continuing to work on that and, and to bring that into focus. And then our fourth imperative is incorporate deliberate equity planning as the framework of the organization's talent strategy. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we move down into talking about the racial equity plan. Turning very at a high level um, to page 44, slide 44, um, just a highlight of our 2022 um, recruitment and outreach uh, highlights. We work with a lot of um, hiring departments, as you can imagine, across the city, providing hiring events, and, and of course, in conjunction with human resources, supporting the employment initiatives of Goodwill Dallas College, Dallas ISD, and a huge partner of ours. Um, and um, I, I, I glance at Council Member Thomas back right before the pandemic working with Workforce Solutions of Greater Dallas with our Think Ahead Thursdays and moving out into the community. And so we continue to do a lot of that work with helping applicants skill up and be prepared for the interview and hiring process for employment opportunities here at the city of Dallas. If you look on page 45, um, I've outlined the, the, the five um, civil service priorities, which again are tied back to our strategic focus areas. Um, develop, lunch, and monitor our operational deliver, deliverables, promoting and advancing our goals that are laid out within our racial equity plan. We need to further our collaboration with marketing and, and of course, human resources to develop, and we've already started the groundwork of that discovery process to launch a comprehensive marketing and branding campaign that highlights and builds awareness for the City of Dallas employment opportunities. Also within that work will be a large opportunity for us to engage in employee storytelling because that's what's going to enhance the employee's value proposition in terms about what is our culture, what does it mean to build public sector employee, and so we are identifying and doing a lot of that discovery work so individuals can understand exactly, you know, what is a day in a life, what it mean being a public servant or a civil servant here at the city of Dallas. Um, a, a continue to work with ITS and human resources to make sure that we leverage the opportunity to effectively uh, assess and integrate our new applicant tracking system to, to realize all of the efficiencies um, that could be gained there and continue to work internally in the department to hear our trial board um, hearings in a, in a timely fashion. I now very quickly want to point our attention to slide 46. We've seen this slide before, I think, in other instances, but I, I, I want to talk about it this morning because I think it's important. Um, the graphic here talks about, you know, the adoption of the racial equity plan and, and the great work that we've done as a city. But as you notice, the graphic puts us at the bottom of this mountain. And as we go up, transcend that mountain, that's when we get to the big audacious goals that we really seek out to, to, to do. And so at the bottom of that mountain is really that hard work of developing department progress measures. And we've been working with our, our partners in equity to do that. And I think that's important in getting it right on the front end in order to realize these goals of equity internally to the organization because we've never done this before. And so there has to be some baselining that happens. And you'll see that I've laid that out on slide 49 in the Civil Service Department progress measures is we want to understand the following in terms of moving this work of equity um, forward at the city. Expand our recruitment efforts, of course, to increase diversity of candidates for city employment but by the summer provide a clear and expansive recruitment and promotion review process that identifies as top five employment and promotional opportunity barriers within uniform positions within the city. Chair Schultz, I heard you in your opening comments talk about the other audit work and the other work that comes along to help us understand what we can do better. I think all of that will inform and guide, you know, number two, for example, um, in our racial equity work that lies ahead of us. The same is true for item number three, is understanding what are those barriers to employment and promotion as it relates to um, civil service positions on the civilian side and not uniform. Then fourthly is we know that the only way we can really advance equity work from an operational perspective is to create um, conversation, collaboration, um, and dialogue around what's working well, what's not working well. And so you'll see in the fourth item, the recruitment uh, exchange of hiring managers and department directors to help us share best practices 
and refine our actual tactics as we pursue what we understand those barriers and opportunities to be as it relates to, to racial equity. And then on slide 50, you see by, by the next fiscal year, you recommend an equitable and inclusive hiring and recruitment policy. We as a city, if, if we're gonna talk about equity in terms of hiring internally, we have to have a policy or, or something to guide that to guide that work, and that's what you see in item number five. Um, and then you, you see you, we start moving forward with those baseline numbers in, in terms of, of 2027. And I couldn't have, I, I think we could have gotten to here without that work of Dr. Rainey and Dr. Wilson um, within our equity group to be able to lay this piece down considering the large, the large responsibility of employment um, we have when we, when, we, when we talk about racial equity, which then I conclude with on page 51 here are opportunities um, that come out of our priorities, this conversation today, opportunities to continue collaboration with human resources and others. Number one, take intentional steps to create a city of Dallas-wide integrated recruitment outreach and partnership plan to support immediate and long-term recruitment goals, as we've mentioned. This is how we build a talent pipeline and formal internship and apprentice opportunities. Continue to evaluate civil service sourcing needs, service delivery needs, current capabilities and identify those solutions to better meet those needs. And third, formalize our marketing, the marketing, branding, and outreach strategy that includes a diversified portfolio of advertising and marketing efforts designed to enhance the city of Dallas's employee brand awareness and our value proposition. We see other public employers taking very daring and bold steps to advertise the opportunity and to tell the story about what does it mean to work for the organization and I think these opportunities lie in front of us uh, today, and, and it's a part of our work plan as we move forward um, in, the, in the next, in the, in the current year, rather. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation and turn it back to Kim. Thank you very much, Jared. So going to our next steps, which are on slide 52. Of course, today, again, was an opportunity for us to really get feedback on a lot of the things that you've heard today about opportunities that we believe that we have between both departments and a lot of that will inform some of the budget uh, discussions that we will have with the city manager on the front end and be able to bring back any policy decisions that we need from the city council. We will also continue to look at delivering on the goals and the strategies that you've heard from both uh, departments. Uh, the onboarding process improvements is a big piece of this, and we would definitely come back and provide an update on how that process improvement, um, a lot of the, the goals that we have around that, how we're doing. <clears throat> and definitely coming back to this committee in April to talk more detail about retention strategies. The partnerships with our departments is key. Uh, we know that a lot of our departments touch a lot of external uh, partners and we definitely want to understand better some of those unique needs, but at the same time, look at ways that we can augment, augment our staff and sometimes that might require third party resources. The compensation study um, that we started and that we will continue, it's not a one time thing. I think it's really going to allow us to continue to make those adjustments. When Nina talked about the different things that we have to do across compensation and balance and then flexibility, that compensation piece is a critical component of that. Uh, the market continues to change and because we know that, this briefing is something that we need to do on a regular basis, uh, Chair uh, Schultz, to continue to update you on how well the strategies that we've put in place are working. With that, I'll stop, and we're welcome to take questions at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a great presentation. I hope my colleagues and the public have a chance to read <coughs> through all the slides, because there was a tremendous amount of work put into this, and I thank you all for doing that. I'm just going to ask one quick clarifying question, then I'm going to open it to everybody else. The goal is to work till about 10 o'clock on this topic, and then we'll move on to the okay. next. Um, my question is, <clears throat> since, so, since both of you uh, shared so much of the importance of branding and marketing and all of that, and frankly, I think the public doesn't care whether it's civil service or HR, that's an internal challenge that we face here. Um, are you going to be doing it as one campaign? Is it going to be worked together? If you could answer that question, then I'll turn it over to my colleagues that are here first, and then I'll turn to those in the virtual world. Yeah, Kim, I, I'll, I'll take that because mm -hmm. I, I spoke most about it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, this, I agree with you wholeheartedly. The public, a potential job applicant, they, they, they don't care about you know what department. It, it, we, we have to tell the whole story of the city of Dallas. So that mm -hmm. means that we have to cast light into what does it mean to be a parks and rec employee? What does it mean to work 
uh, in community courts, which is out of the city attorney's office. When we talk about taking care of all of the talent needs, it, that, that's all of us, and so that's going to require all of us. Perfect. Yes, that's great to hear. I, I would like to add that we also include our communications and marketing department, as this is actually part of the communication of the city as a whole. So this will be done in collaboration between our two departments, but also the communications and marketing department. Terrific, and I hope that when we bring in experts on branding, that we do a deep dive into that, because the branding exercise, 90% of branding is listening to the people out in the field, and, I'm, and, I, and it's gonna take an external listener, I think, rather than a fellow employee, per se. Okay, so let me start here. Uh, any comments, questions? From anyone here in the in the at the horseshoe, really? Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to say uh, thanks for all the hard work. I think it's really important that uh, one we as the council understand um, some of the challenges in terms of uh, getting the best um, uh, employees or workforce that we can internally, and then at the same time understanding um, the process. It can be complicated, uh, and this committee is uh, the committee to provide oversight as relates to workforce. So I want to commend you for the detailed uh, presentation and thank our chair for bringing this to us. Thank you. Chair Narvaez. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, one, thank you. The presentation is excellent. I think we're really going after what we need to be doing, um, catching up to the um, Private, I mean, yeah, private market um, as far as staff goes. And um, I can tell you that whatever was sent out before the weekend or over the weekend about retention got this place talking because I received copies of it um, so many times where employees were asking, is this real? Is this real? Is this real? It's like, yes, it's very real. Um, you know, because I, I think that as we've been here working together and y'all have been kind of just checking out everything, I think we're noticing that. Um, a lot of people in this building don't see us as caring about them in the same way. And, you know, I can't speak for decades of the past. I can only speak for now, but I think it's, they're finally seeing that this council respects them and that you all have been given the green light to do whatever it takes to, to take care of them. And I think um, also it really, I, I'm trying to still continue to find silver linings from the pandemic um, because, you know, we, we lost so many people, but the silver lining from, from it is that we kind of, I think, saw our culture differently at City Hall and then also working by ourselves at home, right? When, you know, with the monitor and no human interaction. And so I think that that's also a positive effect. I was literally just talking about this yesterday at a Super Bowl watch party and we were kind of communicating about the pandemic and, you know, folks were, it's interesting to see that people are still just starting to get back out into the real world and they were talking about um, work and how they were like, I never realized how much they go, they said something to the effect of, I'm never going to complain about having to go to work ever again because during that year and a half or ish, she was like, all I wanted to do was go to work, you know? So it's really interesting that what we saw from all of this. So by also experiencing all of that, I think you all were able to come up with an excellent package, an excellent way to um, help folks and work with folks to, we've got to do a better job of figuring out where people are and how do we meet them there. And there'll be some individuality, right? Like, oh, we've got to fix it this way, we've got to do it that way. And then if we continue to do that and show our employees, our staff, the people that are working hard here every day, that we care about them and we're willing to work with them, I think we get even more out of, out of them, higher productivity um, and whatnot. So let's continue doing it. Uh, I hear a lot of positive things now from staff in the building that are willing to talk to us, and then, um, but it's more, much, much more positive than it used to be So when I first got here. So excellent, let's continue the trend. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member Moreno. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I'll follow up with that. It, it's so encouraging to have staff stop us in the hallway and, and thank us for some of the changes that we've implemented and made. With that, um, I didn't really see much uh, an extent on exit interviews and trying to figure out why, why people are leaving when they're leaving. Yes, um, I believe is, um, we have a slide that talks about the other data points that we utilize, and among those are the surveys and exit interviews. 
Um, not all employees give us feedback, but sure. those that are willing uh, typically are talking about the same points. They're talking about compensation. They're talking about flexibility, and they're talking about work-life work balance. They're talk also, you know, so we hear replicated in the exit interviews, what we hear also through our engagement surveys, which is about the amount of work, the type of work, and flexibility within their environments. That's, that's what the employees are telling us. Sure, no, and I appreciate that. And, and I think, you know, we've done a lot to bring in uh, strengths and opportunities, uh, but, but that person has to be willing to be uh, a public servant, right? And so you have to find that balance. Um, on page 20, we have a graph um, for the uh, for the days it takes to uh, is that it yeah that dates to uh, creation from hire date can we get that the actual numbers in that because looking at the graph is, is very difficult to yes um, there is that graph and the specific details are in the appendix okay, uh, perfect. in more detail um, if I may go to the appendix on page. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Marino, what I mean is going to the actual detail in the appendix. I do want to make a couple of comments about slide number, um, put my glasses on here, slide number 20. One of the things that I think we have learned, and I know we shared this with the chair, um, we want our data to be reflective of what we know the, the situation really is. This dashboard that you see the data on slide 20, we believe that there are some challenges with some of that data. Uh, Nina talked about um, some of the unique things that happen at the department level that may not be incorporated here. So the average days that you see here might not be 100% the average days. As we work through the, um, the implementation of Workday, which we hope to have that wrapped up by October of this year, we believe that we'll have a more robust data set that really does tell that true story because it will give us an opportunity to take into consideration some of the unique things that happen that right now are not incorporated in that data. So I just wanted to make sure to kind of give you that disclaimer as you're looking at the details about slide number 20 that we know that there are some challenges with the data and we want to continue to perfect that. So thank you. And, and I found it's, it's actually slide 23 which talks about uh, the average days between requisition creation and hire start. So we have, this is a dashboard, and I'll, I'll be happy to maybe provide more detail one-on-one. -on -one. That would be great. And, and look, the, the reason I raise that question is we ask ourselves, who's looking for a new job? And it's usually people who are in a uh, toxic workforce. It's usually people who are trying to advance their career, people who are ready to make that next step, and people who are not willing to stay in that job that they're currently in for more than two, three weeks, and so I believe we're shrinking our pool, and so there's some streamlining that we need to do, uh, but I just wanna th thank you all, and, and I'll close with this as we speak about um, equity, uh, just reminding as we look at departments' uh, leadership across the boards that, that we keep that in mind, and, and I'll pick one in particular because of my background uh, with park board, with the park department, we, we need to take a closer look um, at our diversity and inclusion in that department, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to Chair Blackman. Do you have any questions? Um, I, I do. Um, so back to um, that that slide that showed, um, you know, from I guess you know soup to nuts, so to speak. Um, have you gone down to look at it per department? I know we've. I know it looks like we're doing it across the whole organization because in my involvement with permitting, uh, that was their main concern is that they couldn't get them, you know, signed up and in the seat fast enough. If you'll go to slide 24. Yes, um, <clears throat> this, this dashboard actually allows the ability to filter by department. So we can look at by period of time and also by department. And in slide 24, there is a, the dashboard shows information on the number of days, the average hire, uh, days to hire per department. So you can see each one of the departments. And again, you can slice and dice this data. Uh, the, um, the chart that you see on slide 23 can also be done either as a whole organization or as a segment of the organization or by department. So we can identify for each one of the steps 
where each department is uh, having maybe opportunities for improvement. So you are working with those uh, departments to make sure that they're not at the, and, and what is like an average process time? The average days per, I mean, what is a, what is a benchmark that you want to get in? A slide uh, 25 shows uh, two benchmarks. One is from the job openings and labor turnover survey of the Department of Labor. Um, from the U.S. Bureau, I'm sorry, of Labor Statistics, which is what is, um, you know, the most, um, the, the authority that uh, is, is recognized in the field, but also from the Society of Human Resources Management. Uh, there's some benchmark that shows uh, what is the standard for, according to the different types of employee, for executives, professional managers, and all other employees. Um, there's a disclaimer in that the slide. There's some of that data we're able to collect now, and some is difficult because of the NeoGov system that we have. Once we move into work, they were expecting to use the full benchmark. So the, the data is not actually accurate? Is that what you're, or it can be kind of, like it's not apples to oranges? I mean, it's I, not apples to apples, it's apples to oranges. I'm sorry, yes, um, the data is accurate. The data is not, we're not able to slice it and dice it exactly to fill into the buckets that the benchmark calls for. So it is it's data that is it's just, the system just give us segments of the process and we cannot tease out certain information that will allow us to be able to compare. So when we're saying it's not that the data is not clean or the data, actually we just went through a data cleansing project in which we remove all data that was all, you know, recruitment processes, et cetera. So the data is clean. It's just that doesn't allow us to do a comparison because the reporting capability within NeoGov is very limited. Councilwoman, if I may, um, I would like to call on our director of our data analytics because she has actually been working alongside both departments in how we look at the current data that we have. And I believe, Britta, yeah. Britta, if you could come out for just a minute, because I really want you to understand the, the context of why we're talking about the data in particular and how we believe that the robust data that we're looking for will be better served once we get to the workday um, implementation. Uh, Britta, thank you. Kim, if I, I just may, just before, I'm sorry before, to hear uh, it. before Britta begins, I, I think it's, I want to just underline, because I think it's going to add um, some understanding to what I think Britta is going to share. When we implemented NeoGov long before I think any of us were here, we implemented the system as we implemented it. It's hard for us in terms of the, the data is true and accurate. There are just times that we cannot extract data or drill down to the exact level of who's performing what in order to, to diagnose it. But it puts us in the ballpark of where our challenges are and what our opportunities are. But in terms of, you know, who's the person actually in the, in the, in the system holding up the time, we didn't configure the system that way, and that's the beauty for me of even having this conversation and going through this exercise is because we can then take those lessons and as we look at workday implementation, build in that capability because we know that A, we need it, and, and B, we know that the system will provide that for us. And, uh, and I think Britta will talk a little bit more about that um, in, in her discussion. Good morning, Britta Anderchuk, Chief Data Officer for the City of Dallas. Um, thank you for having me this morning. One of the fun things is that when you ask questions of the data, you get to learn what its strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and so the types of questions that we have wanted, these deep dive into where is the baton passing, as Jared mentioned, our system is not ideally configured for that. So we're doing a much deeper dive into validation. We're trying to figure out what other systems that we have that we can connect to help us get more data points, as well as what can we do to create a more uniform entry of the data. This NeoGov data, we have multiple people in every department entering data. Um, it, it's not always done in precisely the same way. So we have a little bit of wiggle room or what we would call error in the data in a statistical sense, meaning the range is variable. It's not perfect and precise. Um, and so I think that that is what Ms. Tolbert wanted me to share, but we are working through that process now. We are meeting with uh, representatives from each department uh, to go and help us refine and kind of narrow uh, narrow those numbers. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. Great. And as Chair Blackman continues, I just want to point out, I, I, I don't want us to belabor this point and use it as a reason not to look at what we have. Thank you, Chair Blackman. Please continue. 
I actually see it as a way that you um, actually create strategies and then fund those strategies. But if the data is not, uh, you know, clean and you're right, you know, data, you know, it, it is about who puts it in and stuff, then we need to make sure because it, it is hard to create a, a system that works if you don't have a full accounting of what the system is to begin with. So back to the data part of this. So what is your timeline to get it? I mean, are you going to make the budget? Because we're going to start looking at the budget and you're going to have to create a plan because the, the idea is to get people working and in the seats sooner than later. So I'll start. So the city council approved the implementation. The dollars that we have in the budget now allows us to move forward with the full implementation of the recruitment module for Workday. That process is underway. We went out um, to get a third party to come in who will actually guide that implementation of that piece, and we hope to have that up and running by October. That is not going to stop us from doing the strategies that both Jared and Nina laid out today. All of the process improvements that we've talked about this morning, we're going to be moving those forward and continue to work with Britta and her team for the data that we have available to us now. We believe that the drill down by going into each department and talking to departments around what they're doing is also going to add value because, you know, it, it's one thing to, to, um, to get to the work that's happening between the two departments, HR and civil service. But we know that we also have some departments that do their own hiring, for example, park and recreation. To a lot of extent, they handle pretty much that, you know, cradle to grave process. So we do believe that there are opportunities that we can begin to implement the things we've laid out this morning, bring those back to the council, and begin to talk about what we might need going into the budget. So we will definitely be ready for those conversations, Councilwoman Blackman. Thank you. And Kim, I suspect that as um, things become more clear that you may need to change some strategies or add more strategies. So we need to be flexible in that space. Absolutely. I think it would be beneficial for us when we come back for the retention briefing in April, uh, Chair Schultz, that maybe we come right back after that and then talk about some of the needs that we might have maybe during the month of May going into the budget discussions. Because we need to get that out of the way before we actually start working on the budget. Okay, so yeah, my, my thing is to get people in the door faster and sooner whether because we don't want them to, they could get another job offer, they could decide, make you know, decisions, they could decide to move. We just, just get them in the door and get them working as fast as we can. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Blackman. Chair McGue? Uh, no, no questions, thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, and let me point out that they're going to be having a talent discussion for Dallas Fire and Rescue this afternoon in the Public Safety Committee for those who are interested in continuing this conversation. Okay, uh, Council Member Resendez, please. I don't have any uh, questions. I think this is great, great. great and thorough, and, and I've, I've appreciated that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So just in the last couple of minutes, I have just a couple of questions. One is I think that... Um, <coughs> It, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to partner with the DISD and with Dallas College and anyone else in really formalizing a program uh, to become a civil employee. Um, we could actually create a tract. So whether it's working in departments that already have programs for P-TECH or some of the more technical skills, but from a managerial perspective and from a career aspirational perspective, I, if I remember correctly, when we were doing the retirement for Mr. Wilkinson and for so many of us, we actually all began as interns. And, uh, and so I think that building out an, the apprenticeship program, an internship program with the city so that they imagine it, I would venture to guess that if you were to poll Dallas students, many of them would not say, hey, I want to go work for the city of Dallas, because they don't even know it exists mm -hmm. as an employer. So I would love to see us look at some kind of a formal relationship with our school districts in Dallas College to see if we can create a curriculum around civil managerial level, the, the kind that requires a college degree uh, kind of program. So that's one. I also think that um, this is an opportunity once we complete the retention module and we get some hard numbers behind this that if we could go to have uh, potentially a full council briefing, I think it's really worth it, particularly before the budget period if we are going to in, have impacts on compensation. Um, the last 
question that I also wanted to ask. So I think the key reference point in this is on our slide 22 is in our gaps. So for the sake of the uh, public and my colleagues, if we could just look at those gaps right now. Um, and I, I know, because I know there's uh, details about the, the uniform, right? It's not just 32 positions. And if you could clarify what's the difference between a position and a requisition, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so requisition, so a position is an, an individual budgeted position that typically has a position number one, two, three, four. Um, requisitions are the, the, the hiring mechanism that creates the posting within our NeoGov applicant tracking system. So it has its own unique number. So I, I, I distinguish it to, to say for, poli for our uniform partners, typically we'll use one requisition to make multiple hires. Um, and that's just because you, you would, if you're hiring a police, you know, a fire entry class of 40 entry level fire rescue officers, you wouldn't want 40 individual requisitions. You would do one blanket and then hire off of that. So that's why you see what seems to be a decreased number under the uniform positions, because that's typically how we hire for them. So I'll, I'll just ask my last question, and you may not have it now, it may come back, and that is how many, how many positions do we have at the city of Dallas? We will bring you back um, the number of budgeted positions in the city of Dallas. That is a number that was approved in, this, in the budget. Um, we know that throughout the year, sometimes that changes. We may have some reclassifications. We may combine positions based on um, work experience and kind of what's happening within departments. But we can definitely give you the budgeted number of positions for 22-23. And then the next question is, and how many open positions do we have to that number so that if my, the reason I'm asking these questions is because I think when we present to council what we ought to present would be our goal so if we have x percent of open positions we want to reduce that to y over a certain period of time and it's going to take all of the all of the key elements that you presented in the opportunity slide of your SWOT to get there. And so if we have goals and measurements in this, uh, I think it's gonna be much easier. And then we can overlay all the very important racial equity work and the other things that we're doing. Uh, I, I think it'll be very helpful. Yes. Thank you for the question. So we'll definitely plan to, um, back to our timeline, we'll come back in April to go into that retention discussion. And then in May, we'll come back with an update on how well we're doing with the strategies that we've laid out this year and what we're hoping to ask for going into the budget. And at that time, we'll present you with that data that we have. Yeah, let's make sure that all of our goals are measurable. Got it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, did you want to add one last thing, Ms. Aris? Um, thank you. I, I just was going to say um, there is some detail in page 56 in the appendix showing fill open and grand total. And that is from the system as of January 12th. So if Beautiful, that's, <clears throat> that's what we need to look at. Perfect, so if we wanna get ultimately, if we're currently at 24%, we wanna get it to what's a reasonable number, yes. 20, et cetera. Okay, that's fantastic. So if there's no other last comments, questions, I wanna thank you very much. Again, there was so much work that went into this and I appreciate it very much. We're gonna move on to our next presentation, which is our financial empowerment programming update and the financial empowerment centers in locations across Dallas. So how do we spend that money that we've earned as employees? Thank you, Chair Schultz and committee, Liz Cedillo Pereira, Assistant City Manager. Um, as Director Galishaw comes to the podium, uh, Director Galishaw and Cruz Correa, Program Manager for the Office of Community Care, will be briefing. Cruz is a little slow today, uh, making his way. OCC is providing an overview of the city's financial empowerment programs and the new locations of the financial empowerment centers. There's going to be a press conference, if you haven't heard, on 217 to talk about where you can access these resources. And we invite, of course, all councils, specifically our Workforce Education and Equity Committee members, to come and speak if you'd like. That's on the February 17th at 9 a.m. here at City Hall. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Galishaw. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, um, ACM Pereira. Um, Jessica Galsha, the Director of the Office of Community Care, and as Liz noted, I'm joined by Cruz Correa, who is our Manager of Community Care Services, specifically overseeing financial empowerment programs. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we'll cover the alignment of our program with the Racial Equity Plan, uh, background of our work, um, and how we've been building up work around financial empowerment over the last several years. And then we'll talk specifically about our program framework and centers, um, and as well as some aligned programs, including volunteer income tasks um, assessment or, excuse me, assistance program, which is currently um, underway right now, as well as talking about uh, developing a strategic plan related to financial protections. So we'll get started with our financial empowerment alignment when it comes to racial equity plan. And as you'll see, um, we've aligned ourselves really uh, closely with one of our big audacious goals around workforce and community development uh, to be the most economically inclusive city by eliminating the wealth gap. So our program aligns really strongly with that as well as several um, action targets. Um, and specifically, our department has adopted a department equity measure um, related specifically to our FEC program around ensuring that 400 of the target 1,000 clients that we serve every year at least are in one of five zip codes that we've identified as having um, high levels of need through the REP. Next up is a bit of a history. It's kind of a long, a long and detailed history of how we've come to, to do this work. Um, starting with our initial work with uh, Cities for Financial Empowerment back in 2018, um, we've built on that over the years uh, through our um, Financial Navigators program that we were able to launch um, in late 2020 during the pandemic. Um, we also accepted grants uh, from CFE, which is a national organization that works with municipalities to provide support for financial empowerment efforts um, to uh, support both a planning initiative related to financial protection, as well as, of course, our FEC centers themselves. Um, we then entered a uh, multi-month planning process with them, um, concurrent with some pilot uh, FEC work we were already doing and partners we had identified, we actually entered a planning process with them to help realign our work with their best practices. We still and are currently receiving uh, regular technical support and guidance as well as numerous resources, uh, tracking, uh, training, and a whole host of other benefits through that partnership. Um, and we were able to do what we call our soft launch back in April of 2022, uh, fully aligned with the CFE best practices. Um, and now we are preparing to move into what we're calling our hard launch or big launch uh, as we have added a, a, a new partnership to our program and additional sites. So moving on to our next slide, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn it over to Cruz Correa to take it from here. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to present on the Financial Empowerment Program and within the Office of, of Community Care. Again, my name is Cruz Correa. I am the uh, Program Manager for the Financial Empowerment Centers. Uh, and so as you can see in the slide, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic in many ways uh, put a spotlight on issues our community faces. Uh, it also presented us an opportunity for renewed attention uh, to a comprehensive and inclusive approach uh, to financial empowerment. Um, and so when I read that only 44% of Americans uh, can cover a 1,000 unplanned expense through savings, I personally, uh, it's, you know, it's shocking to me every single time uh, that statistic is, is read out loud. Uh, I've been in financial empowerment work for a few years, and um, it varies from, you know, that specific statistic varies from year to year on a couple of basis points, but uh, over the over the last decade has pretty much remained uh, remained the same uh, some of the statistics that you see on this slide also are really um, kind of entangled together so what I mean by that is is a few people don't have uh, the savings to cover an emergency it's going to increase stress stress in the household uh, and it may affect other areas as well such as um, being able to make payments on time um, not getting the the late fees for those types of payments and uh, and things like that. And so um, another key kind of indicator of, of the, some of the work that we're trying to accomplish and assist residents on is the, 
is uh, moving uh, residents from subprime uh, uh, credit scores and deep subprime credit scores into a more um, to a credit score that that would uh, allow individuals to access uh, main banking services uh, and, and 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 achieve a safe and affordable um, credit. Uh, next slide, please. And so the uh, the financial empowerment uh, is really built uh, on the uh, the framework is really built upon the integration of professional financial counseling with various uh, social services at, at key entry points. Uh, financial empowerment in general is about building knowledge and skills that help residents make informed decisions that, that lead to increase in, uh, to increase in supporting uh, household financial stability and upward social economic mobility. Um, through this frame, through this framework, we are able to assist residents uh, already in the continuum of care channel. Uh, the focus is on banking access, credit inclusion, asset building, and addressing consumer financial protection issues um, with income support services through client assistance and other various empowerment programming. Next slide. So, what are financial empowerment centers? Financial empowerment centers. Uh, and the FEC is, uh, is about providing financial counseling to all individuals and residents of the city of Dallas uh, by professionally trained financial counselors. And so financial empowerment centers will be located across the city of Dallas uh, through our partner providers and through co-locations. Um, to be able to access the service, a resident that just must be over the age of 18, uh, and there are no income limits to receive this service, uh, and they also must be a resident of the of city of Dallas. Uh, FEC services in general are individualized per uh, per the resident, per the person seeking that, that service, uh, and that is specific because every everybody has different issues and are trying to accomplish different goals. And so we must meet our residents where they're at when we're providing financial counseling services. From a strategic uh, standpoint, the FEC is strategically uh, partnered and embedded within other social services, and so. We do that uh, as a way to not only offer the services to people that are in need, uh, but also to address any other barriers that they may be facing um, at that time to achieve financial stability. Uh, through those partnerships, we're able to um, provide income and outgoing referrals. Um, we have integration agreements, data sharing agreements, and co-case management agreements with those strategic partners. Funding for the for the Dallas Financial Empowerment Center uh, really started in 2021 through the 20 to through the, uh, having the 20,000 uh, plan grant in place and also a 250,000 implementation grant, which we are still uh, in the process of receiving. Um, we started in 2021 uh, first with our first partner providers, IRC, uh, which is International Rescue Committee and City Square. Uh, and in 2022, after we aligned our financial empowerment program with CFE standards, uh, we were also able to bring on a new partner, uh, Wings, in which we were able to actually uh, expand the financial empowerment centers as well. And so our, the soft launch actually started in April, in mid-April of 2022. Uh, and during that time frame, we were partnering with international, or we are partnering with international a rescue committee and City Square. Um, we were able to serve 152 residents uh, during the soft launch period uh, and providing 341 individualized financial counseling service. To give you an idea of the type of people that we're actually serving, the median income of each individual um, for for all the serve, uh, for all the residents that we served is uh, 33,000. And so, uh, as you can imagine, because of the social service integration, we're able to reach the, the individuals that, that really need these types of services. Um, some of the outcomes that we achieved during this time frame are reduced on mortgage debt by 10%, uh, adopting new savings behaviors, uh, access to other public support programs, um, opening safe and affordable bank accounts and other uh, uh, products, and uh, also uh, using those bank accounts actively. Um, these are not all the metrics and outcomes that we are uh, currently um, trying to achieve. Another, another one that's, that would be a big one is also uh, increasing and, and helping increase uh, people's credit scores by at least 35 points. So during the soft pilot launch, uh, we did have some challenges, and I think that is reflected on some of the numbers that we have achieved so far. Uh, specifically with staffing and retention, 
Uh, once we had our partner providers in place, we had financial counselors that were trained uh, by uh, CFE uh, standards. Uh, that training alone takes about eight weeks to become a professional financial counselor and to be, um, you know, to have the expertise and knowledge needed for debt management, uh, retirement, uh, other types of services. Uh, and so when we lose a financial counselor, um, the next person that we hire, we also has to get trained uh, to meet those to meet those CFE standards. Uh, and so when we lose somebody, it, it kind of affects us for a few months. Um, another uh, challenge that we had is we did have a partner that had an organiza organizational strategic realignment. Uh, and when that took place, um, they requested to uh, cancel their contract. And so therefore, we were uh, without that partner provider um, during that time frame. That happened in uh, late October. Uh, and we, uh, at that time, we were also bringing in a new partner, Wings, and so we were also uh, working with them to get them trained uh, and get them aligned and ready to start serving uh, our residents. So the, the Dallas FSC expansion, so we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, we're officially announcing it on February 17th, as, um, uh, and two, uh, which is this Friday at 9 a.m., uh, we're excited because of the fact that the service, the the services we're going to be providing are, are strategically located in in those racial equity uh, partner areas um, or prioritized prioritized areas uh, in Oak Cliff, Rickery Meadows, um, Pleasant Grove, and and um, another place. So we went from having just two financial counselors to having fourteen. That's going to increase the cap, the capacity to serve many more residents many times over. Um, and it also helps us when it comes to the challenges of making sure that we have enough people to work if we do end up having some uh, turnover uh, for staffing. International Rescue Committee is the partner provider that we've been working with the longest. Um, as, you, as you notice um, in the slide, uh, International Rescue, Rescue Community uh, specifically works with refugees, asylum seekers, victims of human trafficking, uh, survivors of torture, and other immigrants. Um, and so their main uh, service area is really about settlement, community integration, and development, uh, immigration sort services. In their economic uh, empowerment programming um, is where you will find the Financial Empowerment Center. Uh, and so it's not the only type of service that they provide, but as you can see, we fit very nicely with um, the other type of work that they're providing, uh, and it helps with um, it helps their the people that they serve. Wings is our newest partner provider. Um, Wings provides a full suite of tailored services to empower women and families. Uh, they do have a nurse family partnership, which is um, really geared towards single mothers uh, who are first time. Uh, uh, will be having a, a child for the first time. Um, their financial coaching institute also is uh, is set up to uh, provide training services for financial coaches across the city uh, and North Texas. Uh, and then their economic advancement program is where you will find our financial empowerment center as well, uh, and where they also provide benefit screening uh, and they also have opportunities for residents to increase their credit scores through uh, credit building access. On this map, you'll see our Dallas FEC locations and where they're strategically uh, placed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're going to be in Oak Cliff, Pleasant Grove, Redbird Mall, uh, and um, in the Vickery Meadows area. Uh, we are also working on provided uh, limited services or limited availability services at two co-location sites within the MLK Center and the West Dallas Multipurpose Center. Um, as we continue to work with financial empowerment uh, financial empowerment work, we will be strategically aligning with other uh, social service organizations to also uh, add additional co-locations. The Dallas FEC is really built on collaboration. It's really the name of the game when it comes to financial empowerment work. Uh, these are some of the internal partners that we have currently within the community courts, our community centers, Public Libraries, Office of Equity Inclusion, and our Small Business Center. You know, being as financial empowerment work really affects all residents, uh, the Financial Empowerment Center 
uh, can really align with just about any type of social service out there. And so, for example, Crossroads, which is one of our external partners, um, their, their main mission is to help individuals in the in health uh, foundation communities uh, and the Concilio are other uh, strategic partners that provide different types of services uh, as well. And for example, Salvation Army, uh, you know, has a, has a kind of every type of service that you can imagine. So being located within, uh, within these, um, within, uh, within their space, within their office space really helps when it comes to trying to serve the people that we're trying to serve. Um, the Financial Inclusion Roundtable in particular is a collaboration that includes the FDIC and the Federal and the Dallas Federal Reserve, uh, as well as United Way and other organizations that are essentially stakeholders when it comes to financial empowerment work. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of room for us to grow and, and to really uh, bring this uh, program to the front. Moving on to our Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, um, if you are not aware of what VITA or Volunteer Income Ta Assistance Program is. It's, it's an IRS program that's been around for over 50 years in which they provide um, you know, free tax services. Uh, it really helps uh, residents save money. You know, um, the tax preparers themselves are actually IRS certified, which uh, can, would not be said um, by all tax preparers. Uh, so the error rate when it comes to uh, providing those tax preparation services is really low compared to uh, the general tax preparer population. Um, they also assist in identify, identifying earned income tax credits and they reduce the use of costly refund anticipate, anticipation checks uh, at that time. And they actually also help uh, residents uh, get banking access uh, so that they get their refunds you know, direct deposited as soon as possible. The goals that are established for our volunteer income tax assistance uh, with our partner providers uh, foundation community is to really to serve 25,000 uh, plus residents. And that's going to be through a combination of financial education uh, classes, uh, ta providing the actual tax return, uh, tra tax repair returns. Um, 2,500 of them are going to be for a limited English proficiency. 60%, uh, according to foundation communities, 60% of the individuals that they serve are Spanish speaking. Uh, and so they're really looking for, you know, bilingual volunteers and, and, and working to shore that up. Um, but <clears throat> we're talking over uh, $5 million in received, uh, received in refunds and over a million uh, saved in fees. When, it, when, when we're talking about VITA, though, there is a huge opportunity uh, to really help residents in this area. Um, in 2019, according to IRS data, th there was over 420,000 individuals that actually paid for their tax return. An average tax return costs about $220. Uh, and so those individuals uh, would have been eligible for, for VITA services, which would have saved them money. When you add all that up, we're talking about $100 million that are left on the table uh, for residents, and so this program in particular is very strong and can can really provide a huge boost and benefit to to residents in the city of Dallas. So there are, uh, I believe, eight locations um, that are within the city of Dallas. Uh, some of them, as you can notice, are uh, within city of Dallas facilities. Uh, they will also have a mobile site that will be. Um, in different areas on, on, a, on a certain schedule throughout the city of Dallas. Um, VITA in particular does partner with the FEC, and so we are going to be working uh, together on those programs to uh, essentially provide financial counseling services for people that are interested that go through the VITA um, uh, tax preparation service. Uh, and so, you know, we are looking to uh, expand the locations. Uh, given the opportunity to do so within more City of Dallas facilities. The last thing that we'll be talking about today is the Consumer Financial Protection Initiative. We, were, we received a grant in uh, late uh, 2021 to work on a, a Consumer Financial Protection Strategic Plan, a, co a comprehensive Consumer Financial Protection Strategic Plan. Um, the process is really uh, started off with an environment scan uh, with internal and external stakeholders uh, to formulate some key priorities and really discuss the issues that are affecting residents 
um, at which point, uh, you know, we will be developing a strategic plan and receive feedback from our external and internal stakeholders, uh, as, as well as yourself, um, and, and hopefully develop some good recommendations that can be put in place to um, help the city, um, you know, improve our consumer financial protection initiatives. And so the environmental scan was completed between June uh, and September of 2022. Uh, these are some of the uh, internal uh, and external stakeholders. We had eight different uh, internal departments that uh, were a part of this process and 11 different external stakeholders uh, that helped provide some of the critical issues that we reviewed. Um, as you can imagine, when you ask the public and ex internal and external stakeholders to help with identifying critical issues, uh, they came up with a lot of them. And so we actually ended up uh, looking into 28 different uh, critical issues. Uh, and based off of that list, we had to pare it down to, to really you know, try to focus on what's really going to um, help our residents and, and, and what's practical for the city of Dallas to you know, put into place. And so the key uh, priorities that we identified uh, was really about the consumer complaint intake intake process within the city of Dallas, um, specific vulnerable populations with se senior and immigrant communities as uh, they are targeted for um, fraud, abuse, um, the tax preparers and the case for transparency. And this was actually one of the big issues that we found um, when we looked into VITA and, and other uh, tax preparers and how um, there really is no oversight when it comes to tax preparations of, uh, if you're not like a CPA uh, and, and what have you. Um, we also uh, discussed equitable access to safe and affordable credit. Uh, it's just, it's an elephant in the room. There's, the city of Dallas has done so much work around this already, uh, but there's still some more that we can do that we think uh, could help. And then uh, proactive enforcement of consumer protection uh, ordinances. And so it's really just about being proactive uh, and so hopefully there's there's some room for improvement on that front as well. And so our next steps with the Dallas Financial Empowerment Center, as I mentioned, we are gonna be um, doing the expansion launch on Friday. What that means for us is we're gonna be um, marketing, looking for the residents. Uh, it's not gonna just be, you know, uh, we're not just gonna be uh, working with internal referrals that are from our partner providers are really going to be out in the community and seeking to work with individuals. Uh, we've also been selected as part of a, a cohort with the National League of Cities Fines and Fees and Cohorts uh, in partnership with uh, the Office of, of um, Equity and Inclusion. Um, and then we will continue to expand our strategic partnerships. Uh, I think that's going to be a huge piece to the success of the Financial Empowerment Center. For VITA, uh, we're also going to be working on those strategic partnerships and alignments to help them recruit volunteers and to get to more uh, residents to provide that free service. Uh, and uh, in doing so, we will be working on communications and marketing uh, within the city of Dallas as well. And for the Consumer Financial Protection Initiative, now that we've identified the uh, key priorities, we're going to be seeking feedback on that and also drafting a plan uh, that's inclusive of recommendations for consideration. Thank you. Did you want to? And no, we are. That wraps up our presentation. Thank that you was so an, much, Cruz, and we welcome any questions. It was an excellent presentation. It was thorough and well done, and it's clear that you have a, a, a clear understanding of your subject matter for sure. And we're lucky to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to start in the virtual world this time, um, and I'll go in reverse. So, a Council Member Resendez, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, just just a couple, and I, I agree with you that it was a, a thorough uh, presentation. I'm, I'm excited about moving forward with it. I, 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 I'm hoping to hear a little bit more about um, the, the marketing plan, you know, how, how exactly are you planning on reaching out to people, try to find people, uh, talk to me about the, the language piece. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that some of the outreach is, is going to be done in Spanish. Um, and if I just want, want, want someone to elaborate on that, please. Thank you for the question, Councilman Resendez. Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. One of the priorities that we had when we were looking for a new partner provider uh, and one of the reasons we selected Wings was because of their ability to have 
uh, bilingual financial counselors. That was a huge, huge piece to what we're, we, we were doing. Uh, in terms of the marketing and communication, it's really gonna be a community effort uh, along with the city of Dallas and other uh, entities that, that, are, that are in Dallas. And so I had mentioned the Financial Inclusion Roundtable. When you're working with organizations like the FDIC, the Dallas Federal Reserve, they have a lot of, um, uh, they have a lot of, uh, I guess, pull with uh, banks and other organizations that will help uh, promote the Financial Empowerment Center along with strategically aligning with those specific organizations that already provide this type of work for example, housing, um, you know, home ownership, asset building, uh, credit building. Um, so, th from a marketing plan, it, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a community lift uh, because you know we're going to have our own marketing, but we're also going to be working with our partners to 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 promote the service itself. Hey, um, and and what what will success look like? Um, for all of this is there x amount of people that we'd like to serve per week per month or, or something like that so our goal is to serve 1,000 residents per year um and it's so even though it's 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 1,000 residents but the real success actually comes in what they achieve and so each individual is going to come to the table with goals that they have in mind for their own household financial stability that typically includes debt reduction um, increased savings and increasing their credit scores. Those three metrics in particular are being tracked within our um, customer management system uh, and we will be able to report on those as time goes on and, and people start actually achieving some of these outcomes. As you could imagine when it comes to financial empowerment work, it takes time. It's, it's not a from month to month kind of situation where you're able to just increase your credit, credit score by doing one or two things. It, it does take time, um, but that's really where the success is gonna come from. And I can give you a couple examples of some of the um, people that we've already worked with. Uh, and so one example of that, for example, is an individual that was working with International Rescue Committee who was actually paying $700 per month uh, because he did not have a vehicle uh, or the credit to get a vehicle and so he was paying $700 out of pocket just to get to school in uh, Arlington, UTA. Uh, and he was you know, paying Uber, Lyft drivers. And so after he went through the program, he was able to increase his credit score and he was able to obtain a, um, a safe and affordable uh, loan for a card, a card note and, uh, and now has a vehicle and is able to move around uh, without having to pay that $700 going to you know, Uber and Lyft drivers. So to me, that is, that's what we would consider success. Another individual uh, who is not from the US came as an immigrant and did not understand our US financial um, you know, uh, system and so doesn't understand credit scores, doesn't understand the banking, and so she's the, the you know, sole breadwinner winner of their household, and through the Financial Empowerment Center, she was able to open up a checking account, open up a savings account, and really start thinking about what their financial household stability looks like uh, in the short, medium, and long term. Awesome, awesome, those are really great examples. Uh, and like I said, I'm excited about moving forward with this and looking forward to hearing um, sim a lot more similar examples um, um, as we move forward. Thank you. Council Member Resendez, if you don't mind, I just wanted to add one comment around the outreach. Um, I do want to let you know that we're working closely with our comms team internally. So the press conference is going to be the start of that, but we're also going to be providing information and materials uh, that you all as council members can share through your respective district newsletters, and we hope that you will help us promote the availability of these services as well. Sounds good. You can count on me to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I also think in terms of the comms, and we can put this conversation a bit, the, you know, our police department work closely with all the apartment crime watch groups. And so if there's posters or materials that could go out to the multifamily uh, property managers, they work with them constantly. And so I think our police department could be an excellent partner uh, in getting out information for these, for VITA as well as the empowerment centers. All right, Chair McGue. No, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair Blackman, council members here. Moreno, did you have something? 
Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, thank you for that story, that testimony. It really is um, inspiring to see how many people we can fo uh, help in the future. Um, it's really uh, meaningful data that you shared with us, uh, the experiences that our most vulnerable populations experience every single day. I am curious, as uh, I know at some point uh, prior for me being on council, we explored uh, predatory lending and don't know where we are currently uh, with that ordinance. Uh, So yes, I, I'm aware of that, uh, those conversations, and th that's definitely something that is discussed. So when we look at the, uh, the recommendations related to the key priorities, one of the areas is around the equitable access to safe and affordable credit. So I think that that is something that could be captured within uh, that priority area if we're looking to go deeper into the financial protections um, aspect. However, um, as far as commentary on the specific ordinance and the status of it, I think that I would have to probably defer uh, to the city attorney's office for specifics in that regard. And I don't know that they're necessarily prepared for that at this moment, um, but I can certainly go back and uh, have that conversation with them. Sure, no, that, that, that's fine. We, we can hear from them at a later uh, time. With that, something that I see too often are apartment move-in specials doing a month off, 500 off, which don't want to cause any harm to those residents who are being uh, taking advantage of these situations, but we also see kids moving from school to school causing a, a disruption in the home. And so have we ever looked at working with our apartment association or with apartment managers in, in trying to, you know, again, wanting individuals to be able to take advantage of, of uh, opportunities that come to them with, with uh, uh, whether it be a month off or, uh, you know, deposits being waived. Maybe we just need, maybe I'm just thinking, maybe we need to weigh the pros and cons about it before we you know, look too deep into it, but I think it's something that is, affects a lot of households. Okay, yeah, no, that's very valuable feedback. Um, and you know, we, I think we heard from United Way, was it last month, um, uh, talking about with Up Together, some of the work that they're doing specifically around uh, the efforts to support families and try to prevent those mid-year moves. Um, as far as working specifically with the Apartment Association to talk about those relationships, I, I can't say that we've had that conversation directly, but I do think that the um, the awareness of the issues that are, that are kind of driven by those mid-year moves and how that can affect financial and housing stability as well as, of course, the education outcomes is definitely something we're aware of and we're having conversations with partners about um, and we've also been looking at through some of the racial equity projects that we are um, looking at uh, bringing forward in in the next couple of months thank you and I'll just close with the amazing best practices that, that have been uh, initiated such as mobile banking centers uh, actual banks that go into neighborhoods where banks don't exist with full flesh ATMs and a banking center uh, to get those financial literacy classes uh, and building on credit scores. So just thank you for what y'all are doing each and every single day because it's truly impacting the residents of Dallas in a positive way. Uh, and so thank y'all for, for your hard work. Chair Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I've been around long enough to remember when this conversation first began. And so to see it actually begin to come to fruition is really, really exciting. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, first of all, is WINGS a community-based organization? Or tell me a little bit more about it. Do you want to talk about it? Yes, they are. Actually, WINGS uh, used to be formerly the YWCA. And so they've been around for over 100 years. Oh, YWCA. Okay. Yeah. And so they recently became WINGS. Um, and they are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. I'll also add, um, just because the name, it does, it does reference women, but they don't exclusively or specifically target uh, female clients. They'll serve any client, and that was actually really important when we did our, um, our solicitation to identify partners. Um, and WINGS has actually been uh, doing financial empowerment kind of aligned work uh, for quite some time. So um, getting them on board has been just a real uh, booster shot in terms of getting the work moving forward because they are just poised and really ready to help us grow rapidly. Um, 
And, and based on looking at the presentation and locations, I assume they have uh, different individuals who are maybe the director or whatever at, at each particular location. Is that currently how things are? That, that's actually, yeah, that, that's correct. So there's going to be a financial empowerment center director. Right. Uh, and then at each location, you have a lead financial coach that acts like as a manager for that specific location and three other financial counselors providing services. Okay. What do they currently have? Currently, each location is going to have four oh, financial. Hold on. I want you to oh, listen to the question. What do they care? Now, what are they going to have? What do they currently have? Four financial counselors at each location. Okay, so each location has a financial counselor. Four. four. Each one has four counselors. Okay. So that's that's specific to the WINGS program. The IRC program is a little bit smaller in scale. I think they only have two. Right, okay. Well, I'm in particular concerned about the Redbird location that's either in my district or neighbor in my district. So if you have a point of contact, if you could get that to my office, and uh, that way I could have a conversation with them, I would greatly appreciate it. Sure. Uh, my next question, and, and uh, Councilman Resendez used market. I'm going to use a different term. I'm going to use one, which is one of our new E's, which I'm concerned about, engagement. Um, I think there's a difference in marketing and engagement and outreach, and so um, who will be responsible for the actual community outreach for the uh, centers that are in each location? I will be responsible for that outreach as well as uh, each organization specific to that site. Okay, I tell you, let's sit down and have a conversation. I Absolutely. think I can provide some insight uh, as well. I think that's all I have this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, and I think that may be a suggestion for each of the council members who, where you have a location, because they certainly know their community very, very well. Thank you. Okay, Chair Narvaez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so thank you for the presentation, very thorough. When it comes to financial literacy, are we in any part, are you in any partnerships with um, the Dallas Public Library? We are currently working with them. Okay, so are y'all able to offer these classes in the libraries as well? Because it's, it's a place that's safe for a lot of people because they know where the library is. They don't always know where some of these centers are. So is that what we're trying to do? Or? Yeah, that's correct. That's okay. exactly right. We want to be able to offer financial education classes within public libraries. Wonderful. And then the next thing I wanted to ask is, are any of the classes offered in any other languages? So especially Spanish. Um, because at our libraries, we also offer at certain key libraries um, English language learner courses, and we all know that the, like one of the biggest drivers to poverty is not being able to speak and understand English in our country, right, in our state, in our city. Um, so, I, so being able to do the classes as well is also teaching them financial literacy, because if the language is already a barrier, now imagine a bank or you know, they're not understanding financial literacy and, and how finances work here in the United States. We will be offering classes in Spanish as well. And in particular, our uh, partner provider, International Rescue Committee, has uh, 24 different languages that get translated through that organization. And so there's going to be a lot of opportunity for us to be able to disseminate information in a range of languages that we hope to uh, get out to as many folks as possible. Excellent, because you, you just answered what my next question was going to be is what other languages and how deep can we go? So 24 is really excellent. And then my last um, question, Madam Chair, is the um, partnerships with banks, um, credit unions, you know, anything but a payday lender. Um, we just, for the first time in 20 years, got a bank in West Dallas, um, Frost Bank, which I'm so thoroughly excited that I moved all my accounts to it. Um, in order to show support and, you know, like we finally have one here in our neighborhood um, because for 20 years it was literally the PLS at, you know, across the street. Um, so now we just need, we need a few other things still, but this was huge. Um, but are there partnerships with those individuals as they're moving into neighborhoods? I, I can only speak about Frost because they just opened in West Dallas. I know they're getting ready to open a new branch in Bachman and they're planning new openings all over the city, like this might be an opportunity as they're going into more divested communities that you know, might help that partnership, like financial literacy and the bank, because like, some people this is a very foreign concept 
a bank because they've either never experienced it, never had the ability to do it, or like you, we were talking about credit scores, they just can't get an account mm -hmm. in a bank. And so are there opportunities to work with certain banks as well and or credit unions? Yes, 100%. You know, we're looking, through, we're looking at these partnerships specifically through the Community Reinvestment Act uh, and uh, the opportunities that, that align with them passing that specific exam, which would be through education and investment in particular. Um, so even though we haven't uh, named a specific bank that we are working with, we are speaking to a lot of them in terms of what they can provide for the financial education piece and also bank on initiatives to help uh, residents uh, have access to, to banking products. Excellent. And then, I, I'm sorry, one more follow-up on, on banks. Because there are a lot of banks that are now just online. You know, they, they don't have branches anywhere. They, the, their branches inside, you know, your cell phone or your computer, however you want to explain that. So are there opportunities to also work with, uh, or you have a, reached out to any of these online banks um, just so that there's diversity for, I mean, there's, people just have different comfort levels with what they do with their money, right? Where they want to save it or store it or what have you. Um, and that's, I'm seeing that a lot more with the younger, younger folks as they're coming up. They're like, they don't want to walk into a store, a bank, a building. It's like they want to do everything inside of the phone. So is there opportunity for that as well? There's certainly going to be an opportunity for that. I can't say that I have personally started working on working with online um, financial institutions. You know, the focus has been on the ones that are present in our communities that we want to make sure that they are um, stepping up to the plate and being a part of uh, this work by being there. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for all the answers. And again, the presentation was very thorough and complete. Um, I don't think you could have put more into it without <laughs> us still asking questions, but it was really, really excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions, we really, really appreciate your being here. And I think the, everybody's very excited about this potential. So thank you for your hard work. All right, we're going to move on to the briefing memos, and I'm going to take all of them, and I'm going to go around and see if anyone has any questions about any of them. All right, so I'm going to start with Chair Blackman. Thank you. Um, I have a question on the small business center memo. I can't remember which number it was. Item D, but, thank you. Okay, so I'm getting the metrics with the percentages. But what is the absolute number of the pool of people that you're looking to service? Joyce Williams, Joyce okay. Williams, director of the Small Business Center. Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Blackman. And the absolute number for the total for the two contracts is 140 participants that will be served. So it's 140 people and we want 80%, 80 to 85% to complete it. And then the employment is 75%, but is employed mean just get a job or hold the job for X amount of time? Or is there another uh, metric that you're looking at that down the road? Uh, yes, the employment means 75% of those that will complete and get a certification will get a certification will be employed within that field. We made it very specific um, because of the fact that historically what has happened with some of the grants, they've been employed in related fields and not direct fields. Again, the other part of the metrics will also be 180 days of retainment of that employment okay. within that field and also what one of the things that we're also including in this is a way to uh, again implement our tracking system that we came before you at the last briefing which was to talk about 12 months of being able to track them looking at the impact of results and the economic impact on the city so we're we're also looking at going further than that, uh, especially when we start talking about uh, upskilling. Uh, Chair Blackman, I know that that's a passion of yours to make sure that people have an opportunity to also increase to advance areas as they move up. 
And so as we're looking at Dallas College, looking at not only getting those certifications, but also going toward their associate's degree of applied science, but also looking at the baccalaureate program for the behavioral health science technician as well. Okay. So when you do that 104, are we putting, is this another program that we're actually, are they creating, a, are we creating a program or are we tapping into another existing program? Well, with Dallas College, of course, they already have existing certifications for okay. IT, but with the Behavioral uh, Technician Specialist Program, we're actually uh, helping them to create this program and develop it, so it already has the curriculum. And because of the increase of the number of students who have uh, autism and uh, being able to be able to relate to that, and we see that that is an issue that is developing, and so therefore it's an opportunity for us to create this and upskilling. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair Blackman. Chair McGue? Council Member Resendez? No questions. Anybody else? Any other questions or comments? I did have one question about item uh, F. The senior, and this was asked from another council member, they wanted to just know what is the relationship with the county as I think apparently there's been conversation for the senior dental program over time. This is the senior dental program uh, over time to begin to move that to the county. So I was just curious where that stood. Hello. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so the county does not uh, fund or provide uh, the senior dental program services. Um, the program actually provides services that are critically important because um, they're also not eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, um, of course, unless they're of kind of a critical uh, nature where they are uh, specifically considered health care. So this service is really targeted specifically to provide um, preventive services, um, regular um, consistent dental care access, um, and even dentures for low-income seniors. But um, no, the county does not fund the program and they have not expressed uh, an interest or <laughs> willingness uh, to do so. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to just make a general comment. I think that our city is offering an untold number of amazing services out to our community, whether it's from financial empowerment to senior dental care. And I don't know how much the public really knows about this. So if I may challenge our Office of Community Care, because you're sort of the umbrella for so many of these things, to really make, perhaps over time, this isn't a mandate, but maybe we could begin to reimagine how we uh, communicate our, the service offerings within the city so that our residents can not only take full advantage of them and you know really segmented marketing strategies uh, for certain programs, but a general one of under, so that the general public can understand uh, where some of our grant money, some of our federal money, and then as well as, of course, uh, some of their own tax money is going to help make Dallas a better place to live. So I don't know that we've ever done that comprehensively, uh, but it might be something to think about uh, doing moving forward. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We will yeah. definitely look at that. All right. Are there any other comments or questions or suggestions? Well, congratulate to all of you. Congratulations to everyone on this team. You're doing great work. Thank you. And at that, that 1047, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Oh, you've blown for a lot more than 30 seconds. Don't worry about that. Okay. Question number one. Having fathered more than 20 children during his lifetime, there's a saying that Johann Sebastian Bach's blank had no stops. His stamina, his influence or power, his organ, or his need? Or his knee? Need. need. You have 30 seconds. Ah, Bach. Okay, yes. so we're That's yeah, the fooler uh, one. Yeah, I think that it's going to need. Good. Ten seconds. Need? No. I'm going to say it's either organ or stamina. Uh-oh. Stamina. Brad? Organ. Brad, we're going to go with stamina, which was multiple choice answer something. It was multiple choice answer something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Correct answer. Yes! Oh. Yes! <laughs> it was the organ. correct answer is... Damn. His organ. Oh, I thought yeah. that was the joke. <laughs> that was so <laughs> vulgar, Brad. I didn't want to be a part of that. We don't think like that. We don't, we've never Throughout the like 18th that. century, yes. Bach was primarily valued as an organist, while his keyboard music, such as the well-tempered clavier, was appreciated for its didactic qualities. Altogether, Bach wrote more than a thousand pieces for various instruments in his lifetime. So. An incorrect answer for the ticket. However, they have the opportunity to use their mulligan now or not. One mulligan for the contest.